stretch my wings Take to the moon, talk to the sun about everything Incoming! Oh, they're incoming! No, no, coming now! Oh, where am I? You washed up. Sorry? <laughs> Welcome to the island of discarded women, my friend. I used to be somebody. Are you that woman on the radio? Your island job is peladora de papas. Uh, sorry, what? Potato peeler. 87% match for uh, your skills. Okay, that's not... Anyway, what is the second best match then? Host of the Island Podcast. Are you kidding me? No, no, see, that's me. That That's perfect for I me. I want to take a stroll deep in the night. Kiss the stars. Now, please welcome Island of Discarded Women, live from the Nord Social Hall in Minneapolis. Uh, hey, Mary, you, you, you got a second? Uh, there was nobody in the waiting room, so I was just... Uh... Hello. My name is Miri. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. I For know. English, say... Yeah, yeah, one, one, one. Okay. How can I help you today? You can say, I hate my roommate. I need a new job, or I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. I love my roommate, and the, the job's fine. I mean, uh... You can say, I hate my roommate. I need a new job, or I don't know. Oh, okay, I don't know. Okay. In a few words, tell me how I can help. How you can help? See, that's a really good question. Um... Well, I've been, I think I know why I'm here, Mary. I think it's because I didn't have a, a plan B ready to go. I found plan B, a morning after pill that works best when taken within three days of unprotected sex. Not, not that plan B. I, I meant like a backup plan. You know, something I could dive into right away. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew this radio show would not last forever. I should have been thinking ahead. I, I, you know, I always thought I would go back to theater, and so I should have been studying to keep my skills up or, or working on my audition pieces, but, but I didn't do any of that. I just, uh, I, was, I, was, I was too cavalier, I guess, and, you know, here I am. I found cavalier. Oh, here we go. Often referred to as the Cats, okay. a professional basketball team based in Cleveland. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for finding cavalier, but I guess I'm just looking for reassurance that I didn't screw up. Okay? For not having a plan that, you know, in the works. But I don't know, does anybody plan ahead for what they might do if, you know, things in their life change suddenly? Follow your bliss, and the universe will open doors where there were only walls. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Even superheroes need to take a nap. <laughs> okay, so you're saying just chill, like just... Just go with the flow, is that it? Is that Don't it? compare your behind the scenes to someone else's highlight reel. Oh, well that's kind of an acting reference. So you're saying like, who cares what anybody else has done, right? Success is no accident. Yeah, okay, I got that one, okay. So I gotta keep working on it. Or maybe it just is what it is. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Thing. Oh, hey, Gosh. Dave. Yeah, hey. Um, aren't you going to do the open mic tonight at the wine bar? Yeah. Well, don't you need to get over there? It's almost dusk. Uh, yeah, I just need to find my... Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. Okay, well, find your what? Did you, did you lose something? Yeah, it was right here. Okay, uh, I, I, can I help or what is it? My thing. What, what thing? You know that thing. No, I don't know the thing you're talking about. <laughs> No, okay, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what you're Gosh. looking for. I can't. I can't, oh, I can't. Never mind. I don't need it. Okay. I gotta go. All right. You're coming tonight, right? Oh, oh of course. So, but if I find the thing, should I uh, bring it? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thanks. See you later. Oh, 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 okay. So, looking for a. Th Ow! Darn. You worry about me. 
freedom's the only thing I need. Woo! Zippy Lasky, everyone. Our open mic is coming up, but first, Nancy, one of our new wash-ups, has an invitation to share with you. Yes, I, I'm still in my island-issued jumpsuit. It looks great on you. Oh, stop yeah. that. Yeah. I'm sure you say that to everyone. No. <laughs> anyway, ladies, sorry, women, I have some exciting news. I've just been assigned by Miri to be the new director of the perfunctory players here on the island. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just tickled to say the least. And I, I'd like to announce tonight that our first production under my leadership will be the world premiere of a searing new piece of theater, The End of the World. Ooh. I not only will be directing this play, I also wrote it. Oh, yeah. Thanks. I, I will be holding auditions next week and would love for you all to come for this soon to be an award-winning play, <laughs> The End of the World. Yes. Yes. A cautionary tale where everyone asphyxiates on carbon emissions at the end of the play. Ew. Yeah, it's pretty grim. But there are some funny parts. Yes. And a couple of songs. Bravo. And a big dance number at the end of Act Six. Wow. Wow. Six acts? Really? Seven. Oh. I kept stalling. I didn't want everyone to die. I like most of these characters. Anyway, there are 63 roles at this point. So there will be a role for each of you to play. So what are the parts? Well, there are three main groups of characters. One group is the scientists. These are the people who are trying to interpret the data and come up with solutions that will reverse the chokehold of deadly gases in the ozone. The second group of characters are the heroic people who are trying to rescue wildlife and plant trees in the forests and clean up the oceans. I call them the activists. And the final group are people who make fun of the activists and encourage the pollution by undoing the regulations on cars. And they suppress the scientists' research and encourage the greedy corporations to poison the environment. I call this group the Republicans. <laughs> You won't have to be a Republican. The Republicans will be played by puppets. Yeah! They are puppets! They all right. are puppets! All right, I hear you, I hear you, all right. Now the audition notice has been posted at the intake hut, so please stop by and sign up. For the audition, everyone will need to prepare either a dramatic reading from the Lorax by Dr. Seuss <laughs> or a tongue twister. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Exciting to have a new director of the perfunctory players. OK, time now for our feature of the evening, the open mic. Yeah. Tonight at the open mic, we have Day. Day, where are you? You all know her. In fact, none of us would have gotten here safely on the island without her. She's been a valuable member of our wash-up rescue team since she washed up herself. Yeah, please join me in welcoming to the open mic, Day. So there was a shaman who began a fellowship at my school. And the day they had a presentation on shamanism within the Hmong community, I decided to go. Before I move on, shamanism isn't a religion. It's simply just a way we practice our religion. I would say our religion is more categorized under animism, which is a religion based on spirituality. Everything has a spirit, and we are all connected to each other and this earth. Although it's funny because I never knew that growing up. And I mean, I still don't really know, 
And actually growing up, I didn't know we had a religion, just that we did religious stuff. And whenever we would do these religious things, there was always a shaman, a spiritual healer, the one who can connect to the spirit world and contact our ancestors or guides that protect us. Now, every shaman is different. They do different things and they have their own restrictions. Some can see the future, some can see the past, some can see spirits, some can see demons, some can't do any of that, and some can do all of that. Please consult your doctor first if you've never seen a shaman. <laughs> but anyways, I'm sitting there and at one point he, the shaman dude, opens it up to the floor and offers readings. Now, even though I am not a skeptic and I have grown up with this, I mean, I've known it my whole entire life, I still raise an eyebrow when a shaman just openly decides to give readings, and this time was no exception. However, I was and still am a poor college student, so I've got really nothing to lose. So I decided, what the heck? Why not get a reading? The shaman looks at me and another one of my FEMA Moan colleagues, who's also getting read, and says to me, you're the type of girl who goes to an event and goes talk in the living room. He had this cheeky tone and big smile, and everybody bursts out laughing and nods in agreement. These are people I know, so I just laugh back because, I mean, yeah. This guy has never met me, doesn't know who I am, and got that right. I was in sweats, too, so there's no way my outgoing personality was shining through. So, okay, that's true for the most part. I didn't like that they laughed, but, I mean, I know why. Then everyone got quieter for him to continue. He points at my colleague and says with this almost approving attitude, you're the type of girl who'll go to the kitchen. He had this softer tone and softer smile. Everybody nods in agreement. No laugh? Interesting. I felt a surge of embarrassment and the automatic need to defend myself. Wait a second, shaman people, I don't just go sit and talk. I help out. I do dishes. I clean after the men's table. I serve the men's table. I don't really cook, but I prep the food to be cooked. I clean the pots afterwards too, majority of the time. You know, I help out. I'm not just the chatterbox. In fact, at events, I'm actually super quiet. I mean, all these thoughts are running through my head. I want to get up, look at them in the eyes, and tell them they were wrong. Interesting. A moan girl is ideally someone who is very obedient to her parents, cleans when is asked or not asked, serves when there is that need, doesn't talk super loud, fast, or even a lot, but like isn't too quiet because then you look stupid because it would look like you didn't know how to speak. Oh, and you gotta know how to butcher your meat, okay? I mean, one of the true tell signs that you're ready to be a wife is when you can kill, gut, and clean a pig, chicken, and cow. Then you're set. You know why? Because you'd make your in-laws happy, which in turn, they most likely would speak well of you, which then would in turn would make your family look good because they produced you. Good job. Interesting. Also, I don't hate people who are naturally like this. I have so many friends who fit that this is the right moan girl description, and that's just who they are. They're lovely people. I have more of a problem with when you're anything but this way and people gossip, say mean things, or blame your family for you being anything but that. I have a problem when the women cook while everyone else is doing whatever and the men sit and drink at the table and the women are the ones to eat last. The order always goes, men, kids, then women. I have a problem when I have to pretend like I don't exist and my only meaning is to serve men at events. Hell, I even see this in my own home. Look, I love my dad. I love him to death. But <laughs> when you are perfectly capable of getting your own goddamn food and no one else is going to eat but you, and mom is busy cleaning and watching two rambunctious boys, why does she have to cook and serve the food to you? Interesting. So yeah, in a room full of majority Hmong people, that knew me, an older Hmong man saying I did the very thing that is looked down upon for a young Hmong girl to be, and everyone is so approving of the other girl who looks like the golden Hmong girl made me extremely annoyed. That's who I am. I love talking to people. I love being around people. I'm not afraid to meet people. I'm not afraid to be in front of people. 
Never to say I didn't hop on the kitchen. I mean, come on. Of course I do. I mostly do it because I want to help my family. But I also know I am not going to look good if I don't, which in turn will make my parents look bad and boy, will I get an earful. Why were they laughing at me? Why did they laugh at me? Why do they laugh at me? Because I'm gregarious. Talk while I'm laughing and speak fast when things get exciting. Because I don't want to just be in the kitchen. Because I am empowered and speak my mind to you, whether you hold power or don't. Because I'm ambitious. So that means I don't have time to go home every weekend to help at the house. I don't have time to come to every family event because I have no time to dwell on only right now because where will that get me if I'm not setting goals, getting my life together? So I have the privilege to think about right now. Interesting. I found myself in my thoughts thinking of times I had attended these social gatherings. I would change my behavior to appear more well-behaved, even though I already am. I spoke softly and gently to show that, yes, my parents raised a lady. I tried to spend most of my time in the kitchen unless I was truly pushed aside because I knew I should be doing that. I consciously made sure I kept my eye at the table of men to see if there was a need to remove empty plates, refill dishes, give more refreshments, take garbage away because my dad would be looking for me to do all of that anyways. When I compared myself to my other Hmong colleague, she was all that I wasn't naturally. Everything I wanted to be to make my parents proud, to make my family proud, to be the future daughter-in-law worthy of praise and compliments, that's what she was. I'm not ashamed of who I am, but I feel discouraged to be who I am. I'm not scared to be who I am, but I feel wrong if I am who I am. I am praised from my fellow Hmong youth for being who I am, but I still get laughed at for being who I am. Interesting. Simmer up, but don't start boiling. Barely ripe, but begin spoiling. Building kites, never to take flight. My smile, my laugh, my voice. If our mind will be my vice. Creating a character, I lay on blank pages. I am here, smiling gently, laughing quietly, soothing my voice so I fit your pages, not by choice. I've got to be the bright sun, but not too bright because I'd look dumb. I am to be a lady that's fine. Walk when told and never run. Smile quietly at all the lies. What a life I've won. It's funny how we live in a world that cements its words. We are given thoughts and orders. We are told we are strong, independent, different, be indifferent. I want to stop. Take a stance, take my chance, not just sit and be a prop. I want to be more than that pretty character. Let me write because after all, I'm the narrator. Simmer up, but don't start boiling. Barely ripe, but begin spoiling. Building kites, never to take flight. Lay me down on your blank page. Pull me up to fit your cage So mending words To paper birds So mending your words To paper birds
Thank you. You're listening to the roar of the female humans. humans. And now please help me welcome my special guest for the conversation, the actor turned award-winning pizza chef, Ann Kim. Welcome. Thank Welcome you. to the island. I'm so excited to be here on this island. I know. <laughs> and we're in our new space here. So, well, first off, congratulations for winning the James Beard Award for Best Chef Midwest. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right, right. Just terrific. And I will have to say, I think you will go down in history as the first person to ever mention the word Spanx in an <laughs> in acceptance speech. If you haven't seen it, you go online and look at it. Um, I'm sure, actually, at the Tonys tonight, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are taking your lead and they're talking about their Spanx, <laughs> men and right. women. Anyway, um, during your speech, you uttered the most amazing, inspirational, motivational uh, uh, affirmation that I have ever heard. And Which, it is. Can I say it? Yeah, yeah, you can say it's a podcast. Fuck fear. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so simple, it's so direct, it has alliteration, it's got the two Fs. I mean, it's just perfect. <laughs> and it's so true. So tell me, you know, fear, fear is really, really tough. What was the fear that you were experiencing at the time that you first came up with Fuck Fear. Oh, man. Tell us about that. Well, uh, initially what happened, how that all came to be is uh, about a year ago, I was about ready to go to bed, and this overwhelming sense of gratitude just rushed into me. And I just thought about how really fortunate I was to be in the position I was in. And I remembered, uh, maybe it was at the time, it was about eight years ago, when my path could have been very different. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time when uh, I thought about opening up a restaurant, but I was, very, I was terrified. When you've never done something before, you're scared. And so instead of uh, opening up my own restaurant, I thought, you know, I'm going to try a franchise. You know, get your feet wet a little bit. And we were very, very close to opening up a Jimmy John's. And yeah, <laughs> ooh, boo. <laughs> The uniform would have been Spanx, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure. And it was in that moment we actually spoke to a lawyer and we were very close to signing an agreement to do that and he asked me why I wanted to do it and he said I spent more time talking about this vision I had, this dream that I had that someday I was going to open up my own restaurant and he said he just couldn't do that, that he, he really discouraged me to go down that path. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that had to do with one thing, and it was because I was scared out of my mind to go down a path that I'd never been down before. So where did you get, okay, so you'd been an actor. You were a professional mm -hmm. actor, right? Not a very good one, but yes. <laughs> don't believe what the critics tell you, I'm telling you. you don't, don't read the reviews, just don't read them. You, you weren't happy as an actor. What were you not happy about? What, what was not working for you as an actor? You know, the main reason why I left the profession was I was, I was done not being able to uh, make my own decisions. Mm. I felt like I had no agency um, over my future, mm. that other people were making decisions for me. Uh, no matter how hard I worked or tried or no matter how much passion I had, that somebody would tell me yes or no. Mm. And it wasn't that I didn't love acting or the theater or the people, and many of them are here today. It really was that I was hustling to do something that I loved and spent more time hustling than I was actually pursuing that passion. Yeah. And I thought, there's a better way. There's yeah. something else I could be doing with my life. So I changed directions. Okay, so the change of directions, plan B came up earlier. Was cooking or doing something like that, did, was, there, was there sort of like, well, if I don't make as an actor, I'll cook? <laughs> no, never. Was there, did you have a plan B? It was like, well, I'll just go and, yeah, tell me about that. Well, I always loved to cook, um, and it was really my husband who's here today. Uh, he's the one who really nudged me and, and encouraged me to go down this route and make it a profession. 
uh, when I wasn't working, I was always cooking. I had people over, and he said, you light up when you're cooking for people. Ah, okay. And he said, it brings you great joy. Yeah. So why couldn't you be doing something with your life that just brings you joy every day? Yeah. And it sounds so simple, but not enough people do that with their lives. No. And it was really at that moment thought, you know, why not? Yeah. Other people are doing it. What, yeah. what makes me so different from everyone else that's doing it? And so uh, that was kind of the moment that we decided to go down that road. And, you know, I, I, I never worked in a restaurant. I was an actor professionally for about eight years, and you'd think I would have at least, you know, waited at a table or I something. I think you're the only one that didn't, <laughs> but anyway, yes. But you're my scared. mother was a wonderful cook, and my grandmother was a wonderful cook. Uh, we immigrated here in the late 70s, and my grandmother came with us, and I was pretty much glued to her hip when she was cooking. Both my parents worked graveyard shifts, and so my grandmother raised us till I was about 10 years old, and she's the one that I get that cooking gene from. Well, that's, I love that, that, I love that, Conrad, that you light up when you do this thing. It, you're not happy at whatever you were doing. For mm -hmm. you, it was being an actor. And somebody in, in your sphere, in your world, saying, you know what you, what you seem to really get jazzed about? OK. And then th to take that second step to say, OK, fuck fear. I'm going to try that thing, right? Yeah. But what I want to know is after you say that affirmation, after you say fuck fear, what's the next step? Oh, man, they're... <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, you go, yeah, fuck fear, I'm going to jump off that cliff. Wait a minute, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, so, and it's, it wasn't... My journey wasn't linear, you yeah. know? It was sort of all over the board. Uh, and it wasn't that moment that I said, fuck fear. I don't think I ever said that until I kind of realized, maybe a couple of years ago, that... Uh, too many people in this world make decisions based, rooted in fear. Yeah. And if we didn't, if we did things that brought us joy, that made us light up, I think this world would be a lot better place to live in. Yeah. Um, and I think we are kind of stuck in that right now, and, and I think we can get out of it. But uh, what's next? I mean, part of it is just having a partner that... Uh, does things that can support you in other ways. So I'm very good at cooking, I'm the creative, and Conrad is very good at, at math and, and, and organizing the books. So we utilized our partnership and put a business plan together and found a place about a mile away from our, where we lived and named it after our dog. And the rest is kind of history. I, I, you know, this yeah, is a 20-minute yeah, yeah. conversation, so it's, um, no, 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 it's right, a lot exactly. more convoluted than I said, fuck fear, and all of a sudden I got a James Beard Award. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, get, I, I get that. I know there was a couple years in between. I got that. <laughs> Um, well, you said in your speech that, that it was sort of a 10-year journey, right? Yes. That yeah, journey. Pizzeria Lola will celebrate its ninth year this November. Yeah. 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 So, and I know you've been asked this before, but um, you're Korean-American. Yes. And you came when you were four, is that right? Yes. Four? Mm -hmm. So, was there a pushback, or tell me about the pushback that you got when you said, I'm going to start a pizza place. And wasn't there people that said, I'm sorry, you should be doing like Korean food, or why aren't you doing something that you know that's, you know, did you get that or am I putting words in your mouth? Uh, I don't know if it was pushback from people. I think it was more pushback from myself. Oh, okay. Um, like I said, if you go into something and, and you feel like you've uh, never done it before, you're, uh, uh, you're your worst critic. Yeah. And I was my own worst critic. And I'm a recovering perfectionist, and I always feel that if it isn't... Who said woo? <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing that I'm proud of. Um, but, uh, well, if you want to talk about critics, so if you want to go there, uh, I mean, let's not even talk about the cooking aspect. When I first told my parents that I was going to become an actor, they literally disowned me. So your story really touched me. Yeah. And I think it was really difficult for them. It was really, it was a difficult period for me. When we immigrated here, my parents didn't come here because they wanted me to be a struggling actor or a struggling cook. Uh, both of them struggled. My mother was a product of the war. My father grew up on a farm. He was very poor. And they had two daughters. And at the time, they knew there was going to be very little opportunity for young girls in Korea. There were really just, there was one option, was to get married and to have children. Mm -hmm. And so they decided that they were going to come to this country, the land of opportunity, where I don't think they realized it at the time, because they thought, 
I'm going to, we're going to come to this country and the, our daughters are going to have opportunity in the form of PhD, you know, MD, that kind of thing. But what they did... AEA, didn't, yeah. SAG-AFTRA, <laughs> that doesn't work. What they didn't realize is that what they opened up us, what they opened us up to was freedom to be creative mm. and to create mm -hmm. and to express. And one thing that I repressed all my life was that sense of creativity because that's not something that they valued. Um, but that is the key to my success, is that I didn't go down a traditional path or a prescribed path. I, when everybody was doing it this way, I said, well, that's no fun. Let's go do it this way. Pepperoni on a pizza, well, that's great, but how about some kimchi? That would be fun. Yeah, you know, yeah. you separate yourself from the uh, crowd. But really, um, and I didn't tell them I was going to become an actor. They found out I was going to be an actor. Oh, and they uh -huh. my mother was in tears. She literally told oh, really? me that being an actor was no different from being a whore. You wow. change your, your wardrobe, you put makeup on your face, and then you perform. So how is that different? So it was hard. It was, it was, I, I literally thought I was going to lose my family for some, quite a bit. But they came through, and they realized that I could make a profession out of it. And then I decided I was going to become a cook next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, what kind of letters do you have after being cook? Chef, Esquire. I don't know. Is there a thing that they're after being a chef? JBA. Oh, JBA, of course. You get the, you get the James Beard thing. So, okay. Where did the fearlessness come from? Fearlessness. Where did it come from, do you think? Did it come from your family? Do you, I mean, someone, someone has to show you that, that, that that's okay or that yeah. you can take that risk. Do you think it came from your family? I don't know if I'm fearless. I mean, I'm scared all the time. We all have fear. And if yeah. you don't have a little bit of fear, you should be worried. Yeah. But you can't, what I realize, the difference between having a little fear when you're doing something risky, that's different from being afraid to do new things that you've never tried. And so when I ever have that little ping of, of being scared, I said, well, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? And that came from Conrad, who in a former life, yeah, he was a financial analyst. He, you know, his- Market crashes. Yeah, you know, his you know, line yeah. of work was taking sure. risks all the time. Yeah. And so he really helped me see that what is the worst thing that could possibly happen in this life? You Nobody comes yeah. to your place. <laughs> Nobody eats the pizza. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, what is the worst case scenario that is, uh, or that it doesn't work? I mean, and, and, and it, is that even a worst case scenario? Yeah. Then it's you actually just... not even that bad. Right, 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 right. You know, I mean, it's, you have one shot on this planet, and luckily for me, um, I chose not to have children, so I don't, have mouths to feed, so there was a certain liberation and freedom that I had, and I thought, well, what is the worst thing that could happen? I lose it all, well, I start all over again. Yeah. That's the beauty of this country, right? Right, right, <laughs> I mean, exactly, and, uh, and, and the fact that you feel that you have agency mm -hmm. to be able to say, yes, I can then go do something else. Yeah. I tried that, mm. I tried that, mm. and, uh, as opposed to that's it, I'm done, I'm a failure, because, yeah. And fear is motivating you, or can uh, motivate us sometimes. Yeah, and I don't even know if it was fear that was motivating me. I was just terribly unhappy. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, I could live in this unhappiness, or I could do something that actually makes me happy. Yeah. And that's really what I wanted to do. Let me ask you about being a woman in this field. Mm -hmm. So it's still a pretty male dominated field. Yeah. job, right? I mean, yeah. as far as a, a world, the world of It's changing. And... It's, it's, it's progressively changing, but yes, yeah. it is primarily. Okay, so I, um, your young Joni kitchen staff, mm -hmm. your, your chefs, are predominantly men. Yes, I do have one female sous chef, and she's awesome, Lindsay yeah. Williams, and yeah. she was actually an Olympic skier. Oh, really? Yeah, and she like broke a bunch of fingers and said, this hurts, so I'm going to cook for a living <laughs> instead, and she's amazing and, and she powerful said, Fuck and strong. Fear. I'm going to go in the kitchen. <laughs> I yeah. think she did. So, so is that, does that, is that something that you're striving to, is that a focus of yours as far as no. a, a gender thing? Is there it's a never thing? been a gender thing for okay. me. And the one great thing about being raised the way I was raised, that I was never told that I couldn't, that you can't. And I think when my parents came to this country, the whole idea was that you can here. You have the opportunity mm -hmm. to make the life that you want to be. Ironic that 
you know, they were so against the creative arts. Yeah. But I think them making that decision to come to this uh, country was tremendously courageous yes. and creative. Yes. And uh, I think they realized that I am their daughter that you know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. They're creative, they're fearless, and because of that, I'm where I am today. Yeah, so your goal is not to get more women in the kitchen. Wait a minute. You know, it's... it's Wait a minute. <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> I would love it's to true. have more yeah. women in the kitchen, but yeah. they're just not applying. And you know, I, it's a tough industry. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, when I got into the industry, we realized uh, there's a lot about it that's damaged. Um, in terms of the lifestyle, the hours. Uh, uh, there's just a lot of things that I didn't realize until I got immersed into it, but we're trying to do everything we can to change that, to change the culture, yeah, and you. to say that this isn't acceptable for us. We're not, we know that we can't change the entire industry, but we can start with ourselves first, and we try and make um, our culture one of the best cultures to work and live in and to be sustainable. And whether or not, uh, I think it, it it's difficult because the hours are so demanding. And I think oftentimes as women, you're forced to choose. Men don't have to make that choice between family mm -hmm. and a profession. And unfortunately, yeah. women do. And we don't, um, we don't, too many professions don't allow for the differences that exist. What, what, do you, what are you doing? You're saying you're working to sort of uh, change the culture. So what mm -hmm. do you think you're doing or what are you doing at, at, in your, your world, your restaurant world? Lots of things. This year our focus is on um, empowerment. And okay. we are in about our uh, ninth year of business. And when we first opened Pizzeria Lola, it was just basically my husband and I, and we did everything. You know, we're entrepreneurs, we're owner operators. When you're entrepreneurs, you do whatever it takes to get things done. So I get up in the morning, I make the dough, I work the line, I clean the line, and then I do it all over again. But that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. If I decided that's all I wanted to do, and that was it, but we made a decision many years ago that we were going to grow. And when you decide you're going to grow, you have to make some changes. And it wasn't something that happened overnight. It happened incrementally over nine years. And there were a lot of lessons that I learned. Um, and it wasn't easy for me to let go because yeah. I'm a perfectionist and uh, I have a tendency to micromanage. So it was a big, big uh, challenge for me. But we realized that if we were gonna grow, if we were gonna make this a sustainable culture, we had to give back to our team members what I was missing when I left the theater, and that was agency, and that was power, that their decisions, their choices, their creativity can actually implement change within our culture and ultimately make us grow. And that was kind of like the aha moment for me. It's like, well, why would I want to create a culture that I ultimately left? Right. So let's do right. something different. Right. So right now, the biggest thing that we're working on is really empowerment and being able and encouraging everybody in our organization to speak their truths, that conflict is something that we uh, embrace and conflict isn't bad. We always say conflict is a source of creativity for us mm -hmm. because underneath there, there's something bubbling, right? It's not always, and more often than not, it's not negative. It's actually really positive. And you just needed to get out there and you come up with all of these amazing possibilities. And if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have three going on four restaurants. And right now it's a really exciting time because team members are now coming up with proposals about things that they've dreamed up, things yeah. that they would like to do. Yeah. And they're coming to us and saying, would this be viable? We say, well, hell yeah, why not? Yeah. Let's make it happen. It's exciting. Oh, very exciting. Good for you, good for you. So the, it reminds me of something else you said in your speech. Um, you quoted the phrase, um, we cannot be mm -hmm. what we cannot see. Yeah. yeah, I think what I meant by that statement was I didn't come about this profession in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about uh, people that have won James Beard Awards in the past, uh, they're mostly men, mostly white men that worked in white tablecloth, Michelin-starred restaurants, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, they're amazing and it takes a lot of work and creativity. Um, but there's room, there's so many different 
versions of success and how you can be successful and how you can get here. And there are so many different definitions of what greatness means. It's not just that route, that yeah. you can be an immigrant, that you can be a woman, that you can have changed your uh, profession multiple times and get to this position. And I wanted people to see that, that, that there isn't just one way, yeah. that there is possibility. And when I was writing that speech, I was thinking about when I was 10 years old and I thought about all the things that I thought I could be for myself. And I'd imagine and, and, and I, I wish I had someone that I could see that looked like me, that felt like me right. and said those things. And yeah. so I wanted to be that for maybe there was some young girl that happened to be watching a Twitter live stream, who knows, that was inspired by that. And if I could have done that, then that's, I succeeded. I, many, many inspirations. Many, many people were inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, that's our show. I want to thank our cast. We have Day Yang, Lolly Foy, Sylvia Pontaza, Nancy Bagshaw Reasoner, Shannon Custer, Candice Barrick Burke, Regina Williams, with Cassie Henning on sound effects, and Zippy Lasky, our delightful singer songwriter here. And tonight's episode was written by Day Yang, Nancy Bagshaw Reasoner, Sue Scott, and thank you to our lovely engineer and male ally, Tony Axtell. Yes. And our volunteers tonight, we have Suzanne Egley and Catherine Farron. And thanks again to our sponsors, Flip on the Bird and Maya Community. And thank you to Lynn Gordon and the staff here at the North Social Hall. And we will be back live next month for another Island of Discarded Women. <laughs> Give the ones you love the most Give more than